so I've had a lot of uh, conflicting thoughts about doing this, especially at this time. Um, and it seems like it's the quote unquote right time to do something like this. Um, and I just have a deep desire uh, that the work not stop here. Um, so I know that not everybody here is a psychologist, but that's my background. And so that's the people I know to hold accountable. Um, and so I'm thinking about what psychology would need to do to help this thing about race and racism um, and fighting for equality and justice be a movement and not a moment. And it made me think about um, the history of psychology. So I've got two pictures here. Uh, they both involve Joe White, who is the father of black psychology. Um, and if you don't know him, you should look him up. Um, the middle picture here is, is Joe White with Malcolm X. Um, and he is at the APA convention in 1968 or 1970, talking about um, how few uh, psychologists of color there were in APA at the time. It, it was less than 1%, if you could believe it. Um, I'm sure people who have been to APA convention since then might say, well, have we really moved the needle so much? And of, mm -hmm. of course we have, but at that point, uh, less than 1% of psychologists were uh, people of color. Um, and so, uh, one second, I've got to figure out just making sure that y'all can see what I see. Uh, there was a, um, yeah, just making sure you can see what I see. So I'm back. Um, uh, Joe White, like I said, is considered the father of black psychology. Um, and one of the revolutionary things he did um, was publish a uh, seminal work called Toward a Black Psychology. Um, and you might be asking yourself, well, what journal is this in? So I could look it up. Uh, the journal is called Ebony Magazine, if people are familiar. Uh, it's a popular uh, kind of common in the salons type short uh, uh, publication. Um, and there he advocated for uh, the kind of psychology that would really look at the lives of, of black people and uplift them. And he recognized that psychology up to that point had been um, a kind of a white man's game. And when that happened, sometimes that meant that the uh, scope of research was not kind for people of color and black people especially. And so uh, he has been um, the main person that advocated towards strengths based approaches and we wouldn't think of cultural competence the way we do today without Joe White. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago and left a long legacy um, and so I would encourage people to read about his life and I feel like he is the spirit that can move us all toward uh, this change that we need to see so that this is a movement and not a moment. And just a little bit about me. This is odd since you can't see me, <laughs> but um, I am originally from North Carolina. Uh, I am black, just in case you didn't see that. Um, and I grew up with people who um, were kind of middle class folks. We had a great life and I did well in school and I was always the one who was uh, out to get good grades, reading all the books, just sitting in the library. Um, and I kind of decided to become a psychologist sort of by, I don't know, magic or fate or spiritual intervention. Um, but one of the things that I was always passionate about was uh, the changes that could come about when you have um, a single adult that can have influence on uh, kids' lives. And as I got older and I learned about things like the school to prison pipeline, um, and the way that um, maybe black peers that I grew up with were disproportionately uh, placed in disciplinary systems. I thought, you know, what happens uh, if we give people like that uh, an avenue or that single um, adult advocate that can help them kind of see a different way? Um, and then when a friend said that she was taking a 
psychology class, I said, okay, I think psychology is my lane. Um, when I got to graduate school, though, I had a moment where I um, was in class and learning about Claude Steele. So Claude Steele is the main author of the notion of stereotype threat, which is this uh, sense that when uh, black kids are primed to um, uh, beliefs about their lack of ability to be successful, they then try to challenge those and disprove the stereotype and the extra energy that they put into that uh, leads to a decline in functioning due to um, hyperarousal in the system or hypervigilance. Um, and I always thought, now maybe I had heard too much of Daniel Steele, the romance novelist, but I had always thought that Claude Steele was a white woman. And so then when I found out he was a black man, I said, no, that is crazy. And at the time, uh, the CEO of APA was a black man. The CEO of APA is currently a black man, uh, but a different one. Um, and I learned that this CEO at the time went to a historically black college that is in North Carolina. And I said to myself, wow, that is just really nuts. Like, I just can't believe that this is the case. And so then it occurred to me that even though I had spent at that point um, many years of school, many years of getting the right grades, many years kind of dedicated to this idea of psychology as a profession, that I had yet to see any psychologist who looked like me. And when I didn't see psychologists who looked like me, it had a direct impact on how successful I thought I could be. Um, and when I realized that I had carried that with me into graduate school, I just felt really sorry and, and sad and, and vulnerable um, and, and caught unaware. Um, and so you th would think that would be enough to have me to focus on race and racial issues, uh, and it wasn't. Um, that came to me later uh, when uh, I had my first child uh, on July 11th, 2013, which is the best day of my life. And then two days later, when George Zimmerman was acquitted for the uh, killing or murder of Trayvon Martin, um, then my mind started turning to um, what it would be like for my daughter, who's biracial, and would she want to grow up and identify as black, even if the world saw her that way? Um, and how is I going to uh, help her cope when I was struggling myself? And, um, you know, what can I do to get some of this energy out? Because I felt like I wanted to do something. But I lived in New York at the time and the protests were very um, stressful events. Not not too dissimilar from what has happened with protests today with a lot of tear gassing and, and potential violence there. And it, at the time, it was something that I felt like I didn't want to put my children through. Um, and so then I struggled. I felt really stuck. Um, and so that is what encouraged me to use uh, my mind in this field that I chose to um, more directly look at the impact of race and racism um, in the lives of people that I would serve and in my own life. Um, so the first way that I ground this conversation is by talking about racial identity um, and hopefully you guys have gotten uh, exposure to these ideas in your own programs uh, but just in case I will go over it. Um, Surprisingly, the idea of, of how we think about racial identity has not changed too much because I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, most uh, phases of racial identity for black people involve some it, um, sense that as they grow up, they have a belief that white is right, even before um, kids know that they will experience racism, um, but after they have a knowledge of belonging to racial groups, there's still this sort of background screensaver idea that white is right. This is shown in the research, um, you know, as far back as 1950s with doll studies and those have been replicated um, where white children and black children will show a preference for white dolls. Um, and so the kids do have this notion that white is right. And then in the counter phase, which is around age eight, is when uh, 
the kids will have their first exposure to racism. Now, the thing with racial identity phases is that you can move back and forth between them. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it's not a stage model where you go from one to the other and don't go back. And so one thing that will often happen after kids have had their first exposure to racism is that they'll want to go back into a pre-encounter phase where they could have a white as right mentality, but not associate themselves with being marginalized. Um, and then moving through that it is common for kids to want to know everything there is to know about being black. So I call it all black everything. That's a song lyric. Um, so they'll want to learn more about their culture, um, but I don't know, uh, maybe you guys went to better schools than I did, but I did not learn a whole lot outside of Black History Month about who Black people were. And so um, for me, immersion looked like uh, joining a Black gospel choir, because uh, at the time I did not go to a predominantly Black church. For my brother, it looked like a really keen interest in rap music and making next tapes. These were the uh, Napster days. Um, so don't come for us uh, police wise, but you know, we did what we could to survive. Um, and so this is the uh, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria sort of phase um, where kids just start to feel safer being with people of their own racial group. And like I said, because this isn't um, like a, a stage model, adults can go back into this stage too. So I find now um, with the turmoil in the country that most of my comfort is from being around black people. I'm doing this presentation from uh, the Southern United States because I came to visit my family um, and that was just the comfort that I needed. And lately I've been doing a lot of uh, black centric things that are somewhat values consistent, but the urgency I think relates to this immersion phase. Um, eventually people can develop an internalized sense of identity where they can um, have a pro black and positive uh, association with being black, but be less defensive about it. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm just gonna do the presentation like this because I'm understanding that maybe you all can see the the slides better if I do it this way instead of presentation mode. If somebody could just confirm, I'm sorry that you have been listening to me jabber on and not seeing anything. Um, okay, uh, so next is the sense of white racial identity. Um, and this is from Janet Helms. Um, and the first stage involves taking colorblind approaches to race, which is similar to the pre-encounter phase for black people. Um, when they reach the disintegration phase, um, when they're trying to confirm or they have seen racism, uh, the response is just to ask if racism exists. Um, and then after that comes a sense of um, a shame and guilt that may not uh, fit the facts. I'm primarily a DVT clinician here at UCBT, so it may not fit the facts, so they wonder if they're responsible. And often because it doesn't fit the facts, um, it goes to a reintegration phase where uh, white people will then say, no, uh, people of color, black people are the ones responsible for racism, for the trouble that they face. So if any of you are avid social media followers, you might have already seen this happen um, when people say um, George Floyd should have done X, Y, Z, or he's a criminal. Um, people that believe in racism or systemic racism have a victim's mentality, um, things of that nature. The next stage of white racial identity involves reaching out for help to learn. Um, and asking other uh, people of color for that help. And then the stage after that involves um, doing independent learning. Um, and so maybe uh, some of you who are white and listening to this might be in any one of these phases. Maybe anecdotally from your experience, you might know that many white adults can spend a good deal of their life in these first three phases where and they don't engage in the work. And so for that, I'm grateful that you all are here today. Um, but in thinking of racial identity, um, I challenge people to think about how your own um, place of development interacts with 
uh, black people or people of color that you serve and the the racial identity um, stages are diff or similar for other people of color um, so think about what happens for example if you're at a stage where you want to learn about um, what you can do for justice and your main mode is to ask other people of color and the person of color you ask happens to be in an immersive state that will mean that they may not want to talk to you um, if they're in an internalized state then maybe they will uh, there's many times i know when i was in graduate school uh, i can remember watching my white classmates learn that race should be one of the things that's brought up potential power dynamics when you first start working with a client of color um, and recognizing that sometimes uh, when you bring this up the first time um, the client may not want to talk to you about it um, and so it's easy to say well my work is done if they don't want to talk about it that's fine uh, but that would be in a reintegration phase of being um, so yeah i would just challenge people to think about how your own identity uh, journey intersects uh, now to talk about racial stress and trauma um, so the seminal work on the links between post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, racial stress and trauma as we understand it today uh, came from the work of Robert Carter who is a professor at Columbia um, his 2007 article in the counseling psychologist it's 200 pages so you know if some of you are not as busy during quarantine you know, maybe you could pull that out um, it went into um, the at the time DSM-4 conceptualization of trauma which included um, you know once you see a traumatic event or witnessed it um, then having symptoms of re-experiencing um, hyper arousal negative emotion and the tendency to avoid um, and not only did Carter look at um, how this changes for people that uh, experience racism and discrimination he also looked at comparing studies of similar populations of traumatized people and looking at the differential impact uh, to black Americans so for example um, he reviewed a, a study of um, black and white veterans from Vietnam and it showed that um, black veterans were more likely to have um, or endorse uh, worsening symptoms of trauma than their white counterparts so presumably they experienced some of the same things and so the difference would be uh, discrimination um, Carter then uh, went on to believe that maybe the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder was not enough to uh, conceptualize what was going on when people experienced um, racism or discrimination and mainly it's because the DSM-4 depends on kind of a big T trauma event happening um, and it uh, relies a lot on um, the different like the, the idea that the event is is horrifying um, out of control um, intense like all of these words kind of point to this big event that you have to uh, point to but for many people especially in uh, 2007 um, that is not what racism looked like uh, so people at that day probably did not have a whole lot of experience with um, kind of the horrors of Jim Crow or of slavery um, lynchings nooses and that type of thing and we're still feeling the effects of racism and discrimination and so he started to conceptualize um, a diagnostic category of racial stress and trauma that uh, relied on emotional pain as the main uh, feature like your criterion a um, other people thought that PTSD was a pretty good conceptualization for race and racism events um, if only uh, people would include race and racism uh, as a specific uh, example of one of the things that could fit criterion a um, 
they did a review at the time and I think discrimination appeared in the DSM-4 one time um, and no other diagnosis uh, mentioned that this could be a potential influencer in how mental health symptoms develop. So it was a gap there. And then the DSM-5 came along and kind of put, uh, you know, more fuel on the fire because it removed this idea of vicarious witnessing. So now when you look at the DSM definitions of PTSD, um, it has strengthened this idea that either you had to have been there for the traumatic event or you had to have heard about it happening to someone who is close to you and, and that kind of witnessing. And so it removes this idea of vicarious witnessing that happens when say a black person watches the TV or watches a video of George Floyd being killed, that it would not allow in the classical conceptualization for a PTSD diagnosis because the person is not close enough to see um, it like as a quote unquote real witness. Um, and so it, it's kind of hard to uh, justify using a PTSD diagnosis anyways. And so Carter was on the right track. There are still people that are hoping for um, the specific um, uh, diagnostic category of race-based uh, traumatic stress, but we'll see what happens. Maybe if you guys feel like doing some advocating, this is something you can work on. Um, but now we refer to racial stress and trauma, uh, and the trauma part refers to this sort of classic horrific response maybe associated most strongly with one to three instances. This is how uh, Carter went on to conceptualize his work. Um, and racial stress, which is just um, talking about experiencing uh, racial events and then having a positive or negative response to that. Um, and so now I'm gonna review uh, our review, so I'm like way at the bottom of this paper, but I made it. I'm there. Hey, look, Ma, I'm here. Um, of the from Crib to Coffin article that goes into a lifespan perspective of what racism related stress looks like and what some coping strategies are. Um, so first we talk about how racism related stress can uh, encapsulate several different types of events. Um, you can have time limited specific life experiences with racism. You can also have vicarious racism experiences. So you could see it happen to your mom, your brother, your auntie, whatever, um, or have that kind of direct report of other racism experience. You can have daily micro stressors. So this is uh, kind of like microaggressions, subtle slights and exclusions. Um, and it starts to get tricky because we're getting into the realm of things um, that can't always be directly observed or, or quantified. Um, and, you know, my, my judgmental self says less likely to be taken seriously, even though they are real and have an impact. Um, next level is chronic and contextual stress. So this is getting into um, your social systemic and institutional racism. So what they experience in, um, you know, churches, schools and the workplace. Um, collective experiences, uh, which is kind of like the moment we're in now as we uh, react to George Floyd. That's how uh, cultural, symbolic, and social political manifestations of racism. Um, and then the final level is transgenerational transmission um, of trauma. Uh, there is an interesting video that I was reviewing last night, and I kind of weighed out whether I was going to show it or not, but if you um, look up Dr. Uh, Joy's video on um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, it's controversial in the sense that I don't know if anybody wants to say that post-traumatic slave syndrome should be in DSM-6, but it is talking about how some of the uh, socialization practices and ways of communicating are very much transgenerationally transmitted. Um, and so they have an impact on the present day. The example that the video used was um, when black parents talk about the success of their child, especially to white people, they might be prone to playing it down and how this might have roots 
in a system of slavery or servitude where um, if you drew attention to the fates of your children, it might would lead to the family being separated or um, some kind of negative consequence for the child. Um, okay, I'm going to show you a video. Turn up my volume. Um, before I get into racial stress and trauma for children. So what are the problems that we're facing today? Oh, racism. Um, cops killing black people. It's like, mostly about like, racist. Like, cops are killing black people. And the cops that kill black people is white. Okay. You that? So what do you think? What do you think that means? Like, expand on that for me. Talk to me about that. Um, so, what do I mean about that? Like, the black people don't like, like, the white people don't like the black people. So, like, so, like, the cops is, like, trying to get rid of the black people faster. Stuff so they can live longer, but they just try to get rid of them. Why do you think that is? You know. How does it feel when you see things like that? It hurts. Oh my goodness, guys! I underestimated how hard it would feel to talk at a blank screen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that again. And I would love it if people would put reactions in the chat. And uh, my my people can uh, screenshot it to me so we could have a discussion here because there's so much happening. I need some more uh, therapist brains on this. So I'm going to play it again. Feel free to put your reactions in the chat comments. So what are the problems that we're facing today? Oh, racism. Um, cops killing black people. Just like... Mostly about like racist. Like cops that kill black people. And the cops that kill black people is white. Okay. You know what so what do you think what do you think that means? Like expand on that for me. Talk to me about that. Um, so what do I mean about that? Like the black people don't like like the white people don't like the black people. So like, so like, the cops is like trying to get rid of the black people faster, so so they can live longer, but they just trying to get rid of them. Why do you think that is? You know. How does it feel when you see things like that? It hurts. Can we talk? I mean, what are people's thoughts on this? First of all, I want you guys to think, because I, I can't see it in real time totally, but how old do you think this kid is? Giving you seconds to guess. This kid is nine years old. Now, I don't know how many people got that, but he is nine. Can you imagine what it would be like as a nine-year-old to speak about these things and also did he look nine to you or did he look older or did he look younger um wow uh the second thing i want to bring out is that he's talking to one of my colleagues rihanna anderson uh, rihanna is a biracial um, psychologist you'll see her later actually i'll play a video by her um but have any of you ever had a kid spontaneously talk to you about the struggles of race just with one singular question prompt that didn't have anything to do with race and if they haven't why do you think that is um and and the juxtaposition of a kid so they're in philadelphia a kid eating his water ice uh however they call it but then talking about all of these painful emotions so you know the the struggles of trying to be a kid with also trying to handle pretty adult things um 
there's just a lot of developmental tasks happening. Maybe y'all are just too stunned to have any thoughts because I don't have any on my phone right now. Um, but anyway, it gets me every time that I watch this. Uh, anyway. Uh, get into uh, the highlights from our article. Um, so some aspects of racial stress and trauma in, in childhood. Um, so as I mentioned, children will show an early preference to lighter skin and an early recognition of racial group category. There's some research that suggests that even infants know their racial group based on like measuring blinking times, but usually I use the age three to four because that is the most replicated by research. Oh, I have some reactions now. Thank you. So many. It hurts. Sounds like a potential trauma to me. It does. It's sad. And yes, somebody said uh, that part about um, you ever notice that as though he's looking to the viewer to to reinforce that experience. Um, yes. Yes. Yes, can you imagine growing up with that feeling? I'm sorry, I wish I could see me reacting to this, but anyway, trauma in action, it's true. All right, I continue. Um, exposure to racism might have a deleterious impact, especially for children. So like you're seeing this with, uh, with the kid too, where um, just the normal uh, place of development for children, it's hard to talk about racism uh, experiences because it seems kind of nuanced. It seems out of this uh, Piagetian concrete stage um, and yet here we are. Um, it, you think about what happens when little kids experience this um, and what happens when the child has uh, a learning disability or some other um, neurodivergent issue where they might even have more difficulty um, expressing and putting words to this experience. Um, there's also some evidence that vulnerabilities of the mother are passed uh, through to the baby in utero, which we know about um, things like uh, maternal depression and, and, and stuff, um, but we think about the impact of racism and there's also evidence that there's uh, the the stress of that is passed uh, in the room to the child as well um, and when children are young uh, the parents ability to talk about race is still developing as well just like i talked about with my daughter um, and so while they are um, still trying to figure out who they are as parents they're simultaneously having to do this process of, of helping a child So in adolescence, um, that's when we start to see most of the uh, research around uh, racism in schools is that's for uh, middle school aged children. Um, and then at this point, uh, because of what I mentioned before, a school to prison pipeline, there might even be possible contact with the justice system at this point. Um, if anybody is not familiar with the school to prison pipeline, it's just a reference to this idea that um, we know from research that black children are overrepresented in disciplinary forces in schools. So like in school suspension, out of school suspension, just random, uh, disciplinary strategies and I say random not judgmentally um, because there's also research to indicate that when white children get punished in school it's usually for discernible things that you're able to observe and connect to the existing rules and black people are more likely to be suspended for things that are um, more abstract less to do with rules more subjective um, and this uh, increased exposure over time leads to worsening consequences um, which is connected or to or associated with um, a, an increase of, of dropout rates um, which then puts people on the street with not a whole lot to do and my baby is here it kind of leads to the prison pipeline and uh, in prison they're engaging in similar um, aversive practices uh, behavioral um, strategies that are, you know, they, I mean, they're imprisoning people. So school to prison pipeline. Um, and in this context, uh, 
uh, desired coping strategies may lead to worsening consequences. So like how many of you have told your children, you know, if something is happening, just say something, tell the teacher, um, try to, um, you know, not fight back a bully physically, but like use your words. These kind of things may lead to worsening consequences uh, for black adolescents. Oh, somebody asked a question. Is preference for the white doll still prevalent among black children? Yes. It is. Um, just the last clue. Um, there is, however, as, as children get older, there's uh, more of a likelihood that they can start to benefit from cognitive kind of behavioral strategies with the, you know, development of the brain. Although we know with adolescents, um, they're still very much doers, um, and while the the frontal lobes are still developing. Um, and there's the potential for activism as a collective coping strategy, something that takes it beyond individual coping and into um, the experiences of their village. And in adulthood, one of the major things that impacts um, resiliency or vulnerability to race-based stress is the transitioning of social roles and changes in relationships. So you think about all the things that happen for adults that go to college, they have first jobs, they're entering uh, serious romantic relationships, and so who they are, even though it might be fairly uh, stable what their values are, how they express those changes a lot in the adult years. Um, there's also increases of health risk. So one of the major um, parts of what Carter did in his counseling psychology article is track extensively the different research that's been done about um, the potential effects of uh, chronic hypervigilance to racism and race-based stress over time. We think about things that often disproportionately impact communities of color, um, obesity, high blood pressure, hypertension, um, heart diseases of all kinds. And we think about like how these can be an extensions of the things that we already know happen as a result of trauma, uh, this hypervigilance uh, setting off of the fight or flight system. And many of these will have uh, an increase in adulthood as well. Um, adulthood is the time where um, people to cope may turn to external sources of support, such as churches, um, you know, black uh, affinity groups, such as fraternities and sororities. Um, they might engage in indirect coping strategies for mental health concerns, such as exercise. Um, and so this is what is common in adulthood. Um, so what does some of this mean for clinical care? Um, I'm wondering uh, who is going to be, like I said, the advocate that's going to fight for an inclusion of race-based traumatic stress in our next uh, diagnostic manual. We'll see. Um, as it is, I think we can all include um, race-based traumatic stress when we do our assessments, just like we would assess for trauma and uh, depression and other things. So there's two scales um, that are gaining some traction. Uh, Robert Carter has the race-based traumatic stress symptom scale, um, and this is when he was trying to more closely map on um, race-based traumatic stress to PTSD. Um, but he was merging into this idea of emotional pain being um, more relevant than the criteria A in the DSM-4. And so um, it does have a strong association with um, avoidance, um, negative emotions, depression, anxiety, uh, those type of things. One of the interesting things they did to develop construct validity on the um, traumatic stress symptom scale, there's a lot of S's there, forgive me. Um, they they uh, tested it uh, validity compared to uh, various trauma symptom checklist, but they also threw in a malingering scale. And I think that was because they're trying to get at this idea that people who experience racism are making it up um, and are having symptoms just to have symptoms. Um, and just so you know, it had no 
um, that significant association with the malingering scale. So that's for uh, your friends on social media. I would definitely look up um, Carter's work on the traumatic stress symptom scale. Later, he started to develop a, a, a an inventory or an interview um, that was more open-ended, um, whereas the traumatic stress symptom scale um, is measured by saying um, to for people to name one to three um, discernibly stressful racial events and then describe the impact. Um, but the inventory is more of an open-ended, like what has been the general impact of race and racism in your life. Um, and that, I forget the year on that. Um, but then we have the Yukon Racial and Ethnic Stress and Trauma Survey or UNREST. And that is from the past two years. Um, and that is also an, an interview style, but has more of an updated understanding of how we look at race, stress, and trauma. Um, hold on, I'm looking for my questions. Um, somebody asked if I could give an example as to what qualifies as an abstract rule of black child may be disciplined for breaking in school. Um, yes, let me think. Um, so disrespect is one. So like what I'm saying is while a white child might be disciplined for um, skipping school, or smoking in the bathroom, a black child gets disciplined for disrespect, uh, loud noise, um, things that like maybe qualitatively you could say make an impact on a school setting, but aren't often operationally defined. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I'll have to think if I have a better example and type it later. Um, but the point is it gets into the realm of the subjective where you can engage in like he said, she said, of so whether what they um, were dealing with actually happened. Um, I don't know if people have seen the show Raising Dion, which is on Netflix, um, but there is an episode where Dion experiences racism in schools, and um, I actually forgot the nature of the rule that the school person was trying to say that he broke because it was so abstract. It was not concrete enough to anything that was happening, and so I think that was around uh, issue three, which is what the Raising Dion episodes are called, and so you could go back and watch that um, and get a good example of kind of the quality of what I'm going for there. OK, I'm moving on. Um, APA came out with some new recommendations for um, culturally competent care. Um, and I'm actually going to pull those up so that I can read them. This is kind of an excerpt um, and not in their fullness. Um, but and again, I apologize because I know not everybody is a psychologist here, but I think that um, APA you know, APA and uh, NASW are right down the street from each other in DC, which I learned recently. And so probably they talk more than we think they do. And so let's just go with it. Forgive my blind spot um, and not including the social work guidelines, because in some ways um, y'all might have this better than we do. Um, so psychologists seek to recognize and understand that identity and self-definition are fluid and complex and that the interaction between the two is dynamic. Um, and so then it talks about recognizing the importance of intersectionality there. That goes back to uh, what I was talking about earlier with recognizing our own identity development and how that interacts with the way we talk to our clients. Um, psychologists aspire to recognize and understand that as cultural beings, they hold attitudes and beliefs 
that can influence their perceptions of and interactions with others, as well as their clinical and empirical conceptualizations. And as such, psychologists strive to move beyond conceptualizations rooted in categorical assumptions, biases, and or formulations based on limited knowledge about individuals and communities. This one is really significant when you talk about working with um, people of color in general or any marginalized community where the research base is not strong enough to make evidence-based decisions. When we think about the bulk of who um, certain treatments were tested on, you could kind of say in a philosophical sense that what we have may not be adequate for what is going on in the lives of our clients. Of um, number three relates to psychologists striving to understand, recognize and understand the role of language and communication, which we'll talk about more with racial socialization. Um, psychologists endeavor to be aware of the role of the social and physical environment in uh, the lives of a bunch of people. So not just our clients, the people that are in our professional network. Um, so we think about the disproportional impact of COVID-19 on the Black population and what that has done when uh, issues of, of uh, race-based race, uh, race traumatic stress come up. Um, for as many people as we've seen in the streets protesting, how many people were in their houses trying to avoid people um, and not getting the connection that would be um, you know, culturally appropriate due to the impact of COVID-19. Um, psychologists aspire to recognize and understand historical and contemporary experiences with power, privilege, and oppression. All I'm going to say is that some of my, uh, my graduate school people probably could have learned that lesson, so let's all reflect on how we can do that. Um, psychologists seek to promote culturally adaptive interventions and advocacy within and across symptoms systems, including prevention, early intervention, and recovery. Uh, psychologists endeavor to examine the profession's assumptions and practices within an international context. Very important. Um, psychologists seek awareness and understanding of how developmental stages and life transitions intersect with the larger biosociocultural context, which is very important for people of color. And this is probably one of the ways that our, our social work friends get it uh, more than us. And I am happy to admit that. Uh, psychologists strive to conduct culturally appropriate and informed all of these things. Look at that. There's so many things there. And then they actively strive to take a strengths-based approach. This is a quote from Joe White saying, I didn't know what black psychology was, but I had hunches. The biggest point I made was that we should develop a strengths-based psychology instead of a deficit-based psychology. My reasoning was that I grew up in a one-parent home with two siblings, and my mother was able to keep us together, feed us, clothe us, get us through high school, keep us out of jail. If that doesn't require complex behavior, I don't know what does. And there's this idea that um, there's a lot of things that we associate with the black community or communities of color that we could be quick to say um, are not adaptive. Um, I was having a conversation last night about the video that I mentioned to you earlier um, and talking about how uh, black parents may not praise their children openly. Um, and I had a teacher on the line who teaches in Harlem and uh, she said that as a response, she might be tempted to make sure that while the kids are at school that she praises them since they're not getting it at home. But that actually is not the message. They are getting praise at home, but the praise looks different than maybe how we're used to giving it or how we're supposed to give it or what the research says when the research is not based on um, the, the lived lives of black people. And so the goal would be to, yes, um, give kids praise, but also help them understand the, the secret, as Dr. Joy says, the, the messages um, and the transmission that they um, can uh, decipher in their own families so that they can see where the love comes from in their networks as well. Um, oh, 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 I'm not going to have time to uh, show you this video that my colleagues did, um, but racial socialization um, is one way that the research has started to converge around um, using the strengths of uh, Black communities to inform 
their care. Um, racial socialization just talks about the ways that parents talk to their children about race. Um, and all parents have a racial socialization strategy. The research suggests that white people most often use silence as a racial socialization strategy. Other ones are preparation for bias, uh, pride, uh, mistrust messaging, or using a colorblind approach. The, the way that is most associated with positive outcomes for uh, Black youth is using a combination of uh, pride messaging and preparation for bias. Um, my colleague, Rihanna Anderson, who I mentioned earlier, works with Howard Stevenson, um, who is the brother of Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy, you know, smart family. Um, and he has um, this racial encounter coping appraisal and socialization theory or recast. And this middle vein is kind of what happens uh, when uh, someone experiences a racially stressful event. They have an initial appraisal um, and then whatever um, sense of self that they have as a racial being will then come to interplay uh, with that appraisal, which might lead to a reappraisal. And then that affects what coping strategies that the family then uses, which then affect uh, the parent and child outcomes. And so racial socialization um, done optimally can intervene at any of the points um, that are indicated with the green arrows to improve child outcomes. And so she uh, came up with a five session family based um, intervention that was for adolescents that was focused on um, providing education on racial socialization practices, um, having a process group for racial stress and trauma, and it was delivered in uh, parent and child separately. Um, and with a family component. And it is a really cool program, guys. Like they have family dinners, they had all kinds of stuff. Um, and they showed that there was um, an individual process that it improved outcomes um, by correcting and reframing racial stress and trauma and reinforcing the protective qualities of racial socialization. And so the immediate outcomes were. Um, improve stress management and those things in the gray box. And then the long term outcomes were these things that we associate with um, um, uh, also a reduction in trauma. So reduced arousal, reduced internalizing or externalizing problems, and also just increased uh, familial accord. It's wonderful. Um, and it also helps improve uh, the satisfaction in the parent-child relationship and increased communication as well. Um, that is a mistake. And then there, another one of my colleagues, Aisha, Mes Aisha Metzger, who was also involved with the Yukon Unrest um, Survey. Um, she uh, works on a adaptation to um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And she uh, did this because um, Black youth did not um, have great outcomes for trauma treatment because they're less likely to initiate and complete it or sustain positive outcomes. And so she went through this process. She did her postdoc in um, South Carolina um, at the university where they adapted uh, or that came up with trauma-focused kind of behavioral therapy um, and she did a program um, where they had also a parallel process and this whole thing is just black 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 so she got somebody in the community to do these pictures um, and they uh, used the basic uh, practice acronym um, that TFCBT utilizes, but then they did their best to um, make it relevant for the Black community through the pictures, through the messaging, through the specific things that um, Black children and, and families are likely to hear that impact their ability to cope more effectively. Um, they used relaxation strategies like we use and also incorporated things that um, 
families are likely to already be using as relaxation strategies. Gospel music in particular is uh, one that's resonant to me. Um, and then uh, both of these models use uh, the, the CLB, CLCBE uh, mindfulness strategy that teaches kids to calculate where, um, how stressed they feel when racial events occur, locate it on their body, um, communicate it by um, putting words to negative self-talk, and then uh, taking a deep breath in and exhaling out. Um, this was developed by Howard Stevenson um, and has been used um, and has uh, good um, outcomes and relevancy and utilization in the Black youth that they um, tested it on. And I was going to have him practice it, but I am out of time. Um, if there's any questions, I know that it is one o'clock, three o'clock over here, and I want to respect your time. Um, and so I'm going to get into the questions that I have. Um, and if you have more, I guess you can ask them. Um, so someone asked, would I mind speaking a bit more into intergenerational trauma? What do we need to address with clients, both biologically and psychologically? And what are recommended approaches to treatment? I think um, going into the socialization practices and the strengths of the Black community helps serve as a bridge to existing um, evidence-based treatments that we have. Um, one of the things that I talked about extensively last night, because I'm coming primarily from a DBT paradigm, is how we can use checking the facts in a culturally appropriate way. Um, I showed this video with Dr. Joy that talks about the transgenerational trauma that's experienced. Um, and as people started to say, yeah, I know that like my dad did this, my grandma did this, my grandfather did this, um, I said, you know, I had a realization that this is where uh, cultural competence is needed because where we might be tempted to say, and we don't need to do those practices today. You know, we don't need to um, hold back our praise. We can be liberated beings. The main thought that I had was, um, I guess, a more validating response of how nice is it to be connected to something that our ancestors did? Um, the legacy that we as Black people have, especially um, those who only are, are, are connected to the slave trade and diaspora, is that many of us do not know much about our ancestry because that history has been left to us. And so when I think about things that have been, that might be transmitted from the ancestors, there's a comfort in that, even though um, it may not be helpful strategies to carry in the present day. And so, you know, there's a space that we can uh, check the facts um, and recognize the vulnerabilities that exist, but also really taking a validating approach, recognizing that it is not in the nature of psychology in its design or even therapy in its design to be validating of many practices that are in the Black community. And there is still a lot of strength there. I hope that was an answer. <laughs> um, somebody else asked, I do work in the area of cultural adaptation of EBIs, and one of our big findings is that most cultural adaptations of EBIs have been done for Asian American and Latinx populations, and few have been done for American Indian populations, nearly none for African Americans and Black populations. Do you have a sense of why that is? I do have a sense. The sense is that probably people don't care very much. Hold on, I'm gonna turn off the the screen. Um, yeah, I, I get the sense that people do not care so much about these things, or, or that they care um, and have not had the access to these communities that maybe would be effective in in having those things uh, come about. Um, 
I know when I was trying to find the article references for the work that my friends have done, I'm very familiar because I've been involved with it for the past five years. But when I tried to do these searches, man, it was putting me through the ringer. <laughs> like I had to pull up like Sage and Wiley and Google the individual journals and then I had one published date, but then I go to the journal that has that published date and then I couldn't find it. Um, so my mistrust socialization from my mother kind of takes over at that point and I say, why is it so hard to find these things? Um, but there are wonderful people that are out there um, doing the work of doing uh, of evidence based intervention. Um, and some of that comes, I think, from gathering at these large conferences where people are putting their work out there um, and, and, and seeing what people are doing. But there's a lot of great work and in addition to well I'll tell you a, a place to start the American psychologist um, I think January 2019 or maybe it's January 2020 did a special issue on racial trauma and they did a wonderful job so my colleagues uh, Rihanna Anderson and Howard Stevenson are quoted as well as um, uh, different researchers for all kinds of populations including uh, native populations and so I would check that out the American Psychologist Special Issue on Racial Trauma. Um, someone asked, uh, it's personal, which is fine. Uh, being a black therapist, how exhausting has it been for me? This is an interesting question. I was thinking about it in terms of, um, when I watched this post-traumatic slave thing, it made me think in a different way about what my predominant coping strategy is. Um, and the research indicates that um, one of the main symptoms that black people will um, show um, after racially stressful events is um, dissociation. And so then I look at the role of that in my own life and how my uh, my main coping strategy is just to keep moving. And so my DBT team here knows how many uh, things that I've been involved with over the past uh, couple of weeks. I've been quoted about everywhere that you can think of, um, mostly in these intersectional Black Mormon spaces that I'm in. Um, and I guess that's exhausting when I take time to think about it, um, it is. Uh, and one of the coping strategies is that I try not to think about it too much. Um, so I'm okay in short. Um, and I've, I've tried to adopt this mantra that even if I take a nap and wake up that the work will still be there. So I appreciate you looking out. Um, if there's any more questions, I'm here. Um, but thank y'all for sticking with me and uh, navigating my tech stuff. Uh, the Corona time has been learning experience for us all. <laughs>